Uh, what I'm going to be talking about is some of the evidence that we have for uh, the harmful effects of this form of energy. And um, I've started working, I've started uh, working with people who are electrically sensitive so that we can come up with diagnostic ways of, of um, documenting their responses. Most doctors think that uh, people who suffer from electrohypersensitivity have um, a psychological problem. And so really that's one of the things I would like to address. Is electrohypersensitivity physiological or is it psychological as the World Health Organization would have you believe? In 2004, the World Health Organization held a conference on electrosensitivity in Prague. And one of the people they invited was a psychiatrist who stood up and said, we can help people who have uh, this illness, electrohypersensitivity. He said, we've been working with delusions for a long time. It was one of the most embarrassing talks I've ever heard anyone say. Um, he simply, he knew nothing about electrosensitivity and simply dismissed it. Um, he received absolutely no questions from the audience, even though there were people there who fully supported what he had to say. The World Health Organization defines electrohypersensitivity as follows, a phenomenon where individuals experience adverse health effects while using or being in the vicinity of devices emanating electric, magnetic, or electromagnetic fields. Many of you are familiar with the symptoms of electrohypersensitivity. They relate to neurological disorders. They affect your heart. They affect your skin. They affect your eyes. They affect a lot of organs. Some of the key uh, symptoms are uh, shown here, chronic pain, fatigue, insomnia, heart palpitations, anxiety, depression, skin problems, uh, ringing in the ears. Some of these symptoms are extremely difficult uh, to document because they're subjective. And Many of them, uh, in my mind, resemble how we age. And this is how some people actually explain electrohypersensitivity away. I'm just getting older and it's quite common to have the pains that I'm experiencing. Or as you age, you simply don't need as much sleep and so the fact that I'm sleeping poorly is, is related to my age. And so instead of the word electrohypersensitivity, which is a real mouthful, I call this rapid aging syndrome because those are the symptoms that we're experiencing uh, when we're electrically hypersensitive. The World Health Organization would like you to call this idiopathic illness, and what that means is arising from an obscure or unknown cause. And what I'd like to do is dispel both the concept of an idiopathic uh, illness for electrohypersensitivity and dispel the concept that it's psychological rather than physiological. What I'm going to be doing is presenting five different examples. Uh, these are studies that we've been involved with, uh, documenting the health effects of electro, um, of electro exposure and showing a lot of these in a visual context. The first one I'd like to talk about are skin rashes and compact fluorescent light bulbs. This is a woman from the United Kingdom who was interviewed by a television show in Toronto called Global TV on a program called 16 by 9 and you can go to their website. There are four different episodes that they've documented dealing with lighting and dealing with power quality issues. She sat, she purchased a new compact fluorescent light bulb, sat in front of it for 20 minutes reading, and her skin broke out in this terrible rash. She went to her dermatologist who couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. Eventually, they traced it back to the light bulb. She no longer uses compact fluorescent light bulbs. Skin rashes are a very common response to these light bulbs, but they're not the only ones. Compact fluorescent light bulbs are making people sick, and there are three organizations in the United Kingdom who have spoken out uh, about these. One is the British Dermatological Association, the other is Migraine Action and Epilepsy Action. Migraine sufferers simply cannot be exposed to fluorescent light bulbs, and whether it's due to the flicker or due to some of the other radiation is something um, that I would like you to consider. When I interact with people who are electrically sensitive and we've conducted surveys to find out what they respond to, I use electrically sensitive people as my teachers. They tell me what's wrong with them, they tell me what they're reacting to, and then I try to figure out how can we study this scientifically in a very objective manner. And one of the things 95% of them say is they can't tolerate any kind of fluorescent light bulb. So I became quite curious to find out what light bulbs emit. And so I got together with um, Dave Stetzer, who's a power quality expert in Wisconsin, and we did a number of studies. We purchased light bulbs, and we simply found out what they emitted. 
This is the way we did the study. We took a light bulb. In this case, this is an incandescent light bulb. We took a, a scope meter, a fluke scope meter, and measured what was coming through the wire in terms of the power quality and measured what was coming through the air. We had our probe half a meter away from uh, the light bulb that we were measuring. We had it on a tripod so it wasn't moving at all. And this is what we found. This is what happens for an incandescent light bulb. By the way, we did these studies in a very remote region of Wisconsin where there was no wireless uh, technology, no, your cell phone didn't work, there weren't any antennas, and where the power quality in the building was very clean because we didn't want to artificially um, change it. What we have here is a, an incandescent light bulb. Everything in red is what's coming through the wire. Everything in blue is what's coming through the air. And whether this light bulb is on or off, this is the waveform that you get from it. An incandescent light bulb does not affect power quality, does not radiate in the uh, low kilohertz frequency band. This is what we found for just, in this case, this is a GE um, compact fluorescent light bulb, a 15 watt light bulb. You can see the huge amount of radiation coming through the air and coming along the wire. This was not the worst one, but it's, it's a nice one visually, so I like to show it. Uh, and this is the amount of dirty electricity that we had. Uh, the dirty electricity in the environment was 65 GS units, and if anyone's interested, we can discuss what that means. With just one of these light bulbs, we had over 300 GS units. Units. And we know that the levels for studies that I've done in school environments, the level should be less than 40 to uh, maintain optimum health. These intermediate frequencies, and I'm talking about frequencies that are anywhere from 2 to 100 kilohertz, if they flow along the wire, they're called dirty electricity. If they come into the air, they're called intermediate frequencies. They're at the low end of the radio frequency scale. If you take this bulb and you filter it, and there are filters available that I've done research with, this is a GS filter, this is what will happen to the uh, results. So you can see that it, the frequencies don't go away completely, but the, uh, they're significantly reduced. The magnitude of them, the height of them, uh, is significantly reduced. And here we reduce the dirty power from about 300 GS units down to 26, which is lower than what we started with. What we started with was 56 in this particular environment. We've tested a lot of these light bulbs. Some of them are cleaner than others. They vary enormously in the frequency bands that they generate, uh, and I think some electrically sensitive people could probably tolerate the cleaner ones. OTT lights, OTT lights are among the cleanest that we tested. What's the significance of this? Well, the significance of this is a lot of countries are banning energy inefficient light bulbs, and the light bulbs that we have available currently are the compact fluorescents. They're the ones that are affordable. Uh, but um, so I think we're going to have a very serious problem as more and more people use them they're going to become sick and I think the solution is a special type of LED light light emitting diode it's called a CLED some LEDs are actually actually produce dirty electricity uh, but this particular light bulb doesn't um, it's very clean it doesn't have mercury and it's not making people sick so I think instead of going the CFL route I think we should go the C um, uh, CFL, we should go the LED route. My second example is going to be of multiple sclerosis and a plasma television. When I first started doing research with meters, um, one of the studies I, I read was a, a school in Wisconsin that had sick building syndrome. And very often when you have a building that, that where people are getting sick, you assume it's mold or chemicals. Those are the two things that come to mind. And in this particular school, they cleaned up the mold. They uh, stopped using some of the chemicals they were using. They weren't using pesticides. And the teachers came back in, the, in September, and the students came back, and they got sick again. And so they called in a power quality expert. He looked at the uh, frequencies that were on the wires. He said there's a really large problem of dirty electricity here. And by the way, a lot of schools have this problem because of their computers and their fluorescent lighting. The levels in this room are very bad and Sam's going to give you some information about them. 